Hello everybody, welcome to yet another Social Blueprint interview where it is our goal to bring access to you, very unique people in the Jewish community. And with us today, I'm joined by David Sathwick, who I think a lot of you, certainly the most of you, would know at a political level representing us here in Caulfield locally. But what I want to talk about is David the person, not the politician. I want everybody to know David the way that I know David. And with us today, David, welcome. Great to be with you, Greg. Thanks. Hey, David, as I said, you know, everybody knows about you on the political level, but can you just take a step back for a second? Tell us, what was your house like growing up? Because obviously it shaped the person that you are yeah. today. Oh, that's a great question. So um, interestingly enough, I had a family upbringing where um, education was important, but both my parents never had one. So they both left school very early. Uh, and I think for me, uh, which which was the most interesting is they allowed us to kind of do our own thing in right. terms of set our own journey. I, I recall even during my VC exams, my parents didn't know when they were. So for, for somebody to actually get through uh, was a big thing and, and go to university was a big thing for them. But they always, they always supported us, my brother and my sister and me in anything that we did, which was just a great upbringing. The other thing was my parents, my my grandmother Adele, my auntie Rosalie and other aunties, and my auntie Rosalie runs a pot shop shop. Um, my, my grandmother Adele was helping people at the age of 90. She'd go to Montefiore and say, I'm just going to help the old people. So um, for me, I grew up around role models in family that, was, that giving back was just part of what you do. So as our community is so well known for in the Jewish community about giving back and supporting people. And, and I know that's with social bl blueprint, that's what you talk about, but um, it's just, for me, that set my journey. Right. And also it sounds like you had a very, very flexible call upbringing. And maybe, as I said, you know, a lot of people, you know, you as a politician, but there's a heck of a lot more there to it. You have a very diverse business background as well. Yeah. Can you just talk to us a little bit about some of those endeavors? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think the other the other half of people that know me is the is the DJ, right? So um, that that was really, and I still get requests now for people coming uh, asking me to do a comeback or do a reunion or whatever else, and you ne never say never, right? But um, but I love that time. So I spent you know from the age of eighteen. Uh, when all of my friends were turning 18 at school, I actually set up the DJ business and, and I saw life moments of people. I, I, I saw the best times of people right. from bar mitzvah age, 18th, 21st weddings. And I just saw people um, enjoy those moments. And, and so for 20 years, I did that. In fact, right up till uh, when I became the Member of Parliament, I, I, I was DJing and I even recall about four months out from the 2010 election, I, I had my last gig that was booked on booked from two years earlier. And even though my, my head had transitioned into doing other things, I felt that my heart still needed to be there helping enjoy the simcha that I was um, involved with. So people know me a lot as the, as, you know, the DJ that turned politician, but where I think people within our community don't realise is I was involved in a lot of startups and probably the most successful one was a cosmetics company, which I set from nothing. And in fact, only yesterday I, I, I met the uh, managing director of Kmart and Kmart gave me my biggest break because I came up with an idea for a natural skincare product with no more than an idea. I got a graphic designer to put some labels together for me. I put this, went to Kmart, the buyer, and they said to me, we'll take it because no one had a natural product for the mass market. Body Shop was there, but they didn't have anything. And else. I have to interrupt you. This was years ago, really when it was before it was truly in vogue. Well, it was 25, yeah, 25 years ago. So we were very much the first natural skincare business based in Melbourne. Uh, and we got a, our first order from Kmart, which was $140,000. I remember to this day, I had four weeks to be able to source it. That bootstrapped my business to then be able to grow it into a very successful business. But the big thing about that, which I think was a turning point for me, is we gave 10% of our profits back to homeless, long-term unemployed, environment causes. Uh, I ended up joining Ardoc Youth Foundation, became the president of Ardoc for a number of years. We gave a boat for dolphin research to help, in, uh, help with uh, marine biology in the Bay. 
Uh, and I can remember even the Dolphin Research Project coming to me and saying, we need a boat. Our little rubber dinghy is no longer, you know, viable. good enough and viable. So I said, how much do you need for the boat? And they said, 20,000. And I didn't have the 20,000. So I put the money on my credit card because I needed the boat. And, you know, there were things like that where we had, every one we employed was pretty much under 30. A lot of the people were from homeless backgrounds. We brought people together and we launched the boat and everyone was involved in it. So the success of that business was because we all believed in something. And I think that set me up for the bigger purpose because all I was doing was, uh, in the end, selling product and creating ranges of product so I could help different causes. And then I thought, well, maybe I can do something bigger than that. And that's where the politics kicked in. Yeah, definitely. And before we get to politics, yeah, yeah. though, I do want to, and I do want to mm. get there. Mm. I also want to talk about life skills because to yeah. me, one of the, it's great to have ideas, but yeah. we need skills to execute them. And one of the skills to me that you have is communication. And can you just talk us through, even from the point of view as a DJ, a DJ is a communicator at heart or sales. Yeah. I know that people don't like the word sales, but let's use the word communication. How did you develop that skill? Yeah, well, look, um, Good question. I mean, I suppose you, you kind of do that in um, you, you're who you are. And right. I think for me, uh, no matter what you do, it's about that authentic person. And, right. that, and I'm not, I mean, I'm, we'll talk about the politics, but right. you know, just generally, I mean, whatever I do, uh, it's about coming from a real place. Right. So, so my community stuff and my sense of community is who I am. Right. So, so it's very, very easy to, if you like, sell something if you're genuine. Right. And, uh, and yeah, look, I mean, back at school, I did the debating stuff, and uh, I remember, you know, I, I went for school captain at Scopus. I didn't get there, so I went to the, um, I went to the school principal, and I said, look, I didn't make it a school captain, but can we set up a student council, because I want to advocate about issues for the for the student body and next minute I'm president, I created my own body and I became right. president of the student council. So uh, I've always been someone about never say, you know, like just never give up. You know, right. I'm really determined to keep going. My family always taught me, particularly through hard work and said, look, if you can't get in through the door, find a window. Right. That's and, a great expression. And, you know, literally was about just never giving up. And, you know, like people will tell you no and, and, and just don't take no. Uh, and, you know, I know I keep wanting to come back to today, but I know certainly in the stuff that I do from day to day, a lot of the people that come and see me is all about, they can't find a path forward. And I think right. no matter what you do in life, and I think my job now, it's less about politics in terms of the stuff that I do, but it's more about what I've been doing all my life. It's about connecting people. That's right. And as I said, like to me, you're an amazing communicator. Uh, that's the the key element all throughout all your journeys, and I was just curious how you developed that. Yeah, yeah. Look, look um, I've I've tried and done so many things. I think you're right. The DJing stuff, I don't give it as much um, uh, kudos as what what it actually did for me. But to go out there and literally entertain in sometimes thousands of people, and I was explaining only to somebody the other day. A young person said, "Oh, I, I, he was actually doing some interning with me and." not Jewish, and, and and he's heard the DJ thing come up with people. And he says, I'm, sure. I'm hearing it everywhere, I just can't. He said, so, oh, you know, would you spin tracks and did, would you mix, what did you do? I said, actually, I wasn't so much the DJ as I was the party starter and activator. Right. So I had DJs in the end working for me, but what I really did was got out the front and interacted with people. And so there's a, there's a strong message there in that, you know, you can have a DJ that sits in a corner or you can have somebody that actually connects people and, 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 and builds a party and gives people that, that experience to belong. And so that is no different in anything you can do. You can kind of be an ancillary or you can be right in the heart of it, which is what I've tried to do in everything that I do. Uh, and it's, connect, it's back to connecting people. And I had the most success in that people who didn't even know one another so much when they'd come to a party would leave best friends. And my job was to kind of activ activate those relationships. Yeah, and I suppose you're doing that now on a much higher <laughs> level. Fun fact before you go, yeah, yeah. That, uh, David, there's another David, David Solomon, the CEO of Golden Sachs, who is a DJ as well and still does it to this day. There you go. So there maybe go. there's something so, in it and maybe we should all yeah. become DJs. <clears throat> 
Turning, David, you know, more towards the present day, yeah. you mentioned about, you know, helping people, community. How does your current career in politics achieve that for you and give you that satisfaction? Because I know we've witnessed it firsthand at the very local level, my wife and I, but I'm just curious to hear from your point of view. Well, that's very funny. I've got to tell that story, right? In that I know very soon after I was elected, we had floods in Caulfield. Exactly. And I, it, was, it was a shutter, so it was on a Friday night, and I got a phone call to say our street's flooded and we're just down the street from you, right? And, uh, you know, expecting that I was, you know, uh, had experience in emergency services. I, ironically, I ended up becoming an assistant minister for emergency services, but back then I was, I had no idea. So I, I remember just get, saying to Haley, and we're having Shabbos and I said, look, I've got to go out, people are in, in trouble, I've got to go and help. So I was walking through the streets, trying to help people out of their cars and what have you, and the street was like up to our hips almost with water, and there's one poor guy that was stranded in his car just out the front of your house. So that, and that's kind of it, you know, like, um, it's interesting, and not not to get into what people and everything do, but um, you know, we, our family—it's a journey for all of us. So, and I wouldn't have done this job unless we're all in it together. Right. And so, I'll be in a situation where you know we'll be in surface or whatever, and there there could be a flood or a fire or whatever. And Haley just knows I'm I'm on the next plane, and you come out, and that that that's not happening in Caulfield, but there are other people around Victoria that. It's, it's again a leadership thing. You're not out there putting out the fire, but you're out there helping people and connecting people and supporting people. So the, the, the job has, it, has its downsides in that, you know, it's a 24 seven job, but it's the best job. I mean, I don't even call it a job, but it's the best thing to do because you're able to help people right. at the real times of need. And I think COVID particularly saw that because, you know, when a lot of people were at their worst, you know, here I was at nine, 10 o'clock at night, pick up calls, trying to help people get home that were struggling to get home, seeing a loved one that was dying of cancer and not being able to get into their hospital. And the emotional kind of roller coaster that, that, that I went through, along with everyone else in that journey was just massive. Right. <clears throat> you know, David, turning the subjects a little bit right now, a little, we have to ask politics, it is a combat sport, let's be <laughs> honest about it. Um, but you know, you also mentioned that you have a never give up attitude. How does that attitude play out, as I said, in what can be a very difficult situation? Look, it's interesting. Um, the thing probably I hate the most about politics is the competitive element. To it, it is. Particularly in, particularly in the parliament. I think the parliament is probably sometimes at its best that people don't see when we do uh, parliamentary committee work where you work with both sides of parliament, all sides of parliament. And, and I chaired the education and training committee in my first couple of years. We did a reporting to gifted kids, which has now changed the way our gifted and talented kids are supported in Victoria. They were completely lost for a number of years. There wasn't the programs available. I looked at music in schools. I did agricultural stuff, things that we did jointly is an all party side. But the other side of that is you're in parliament screaming and shouting at one another in question time and calling people that if you did that in a workplace, you'd lose your job. <laughs> so that's stuff I don't like, but it's kind of, you get in this situation where it's like the bully in the playground, like someone keeps screaming at you and do you just sit there and take it and move on? Or occasionally do you, do you have a go back? And occasionally you do because you stand up for yourself. It's not great, but at the end of the day, the thing that I love about this is it's about the community. So no matter what you do, no matter whatever job, no matter change, and there's been wonderful stuff that we'll probably talk about, you know, like the swastika ban and other things I've been able to do. But all politics for me is local. And, you know, when you find somebody that hasn't got accommodation or hasn't got the next meal or just needs a support, that's the best thing for me about this job. Yeah, that's incredible. And David, you know, as you said, you know, community and starting local, the most local place, of course, is your family. Mm. And your children are very involved in the community. How do you, and I say this as a parent, how do we get our children to understand that there's a world out there a lot bigger than themselves? How do you do it? Yeah, look, that is a really, really good question. And uh, I think kids are being involved, but our involvement when we were kind of growing up in terms of you join, you join, you join something, you become a member, you become active, you go on rallies and do whatever else. Today, you put a 
Facebook post up and you've you've kind of you've had your fight. Right. Uh, so how do you activate people to understand more? So I mean, even things like climate change, which we've been very much, and I've moved, I, I I take you know a lot of pride in moving our party at a state level into an area where we're taking politics out of climate change and we're, we're setting up you know real targets and it's a race to the top not a fight right so that's been a challenge that i've had myself but then i talk to other young people that climate change is really important to them and I have a conversation and say well give us some ideas and even with that i still find some young people say look it's really important to me but i don't know i don't know much and so, on, so it's so. like you know like okay great well you've got the cause now let's flesh it out with some real substance behind that. And so I think the challenge for us is how do we motivate, engage and provide information, which is a real key for young people to make informed decisions going forward. So, um, and I think that's probably lacking in terms of, in terms of our education system, it's been kind of steering a lot of young people down a path without giving them the life skills to make their own decisions and to get involved and to be able to become really active in whatever area and passion that they have. But how have you been able to so successfully transfer that, I guess, a thought to an action with yeah, your children? Yeah, so, and it's not just with my children, but children is an important starting yeah. point. So, so I run an <clears throat> internship program, which, which is, you know, people our kids' age, um, and I bring them in and I activate them in the same way as say, right, well, I sit down with a young person, as I've done with our kids, and say, what's important to you? What's your main areas? And then it's, how can we provide support mentoring around that? So I've got, you know, I've got a whole range of young people doing interesting projects right. that are not necessarily even political, but they're things that will help develop them. So, and then providing them doors that can be open where they can get that information from them, giving them that support. And we've always been very encouraging for our kids to, um, to do like you have in terms of you know doing whatever they want to do and giving them that support i suppose for us as well we've had a very adult approach into what we do at the in the home as well we did never help hid anything from our kids right and uh we sit down about everything and you know when we're having a meal we're talking about issues of the day they, they're kind of immersed in whatever we do and i suppose they could have gone either way they could have gone completely the opposite <coughs> and said we just don't want to borrow this and interestingly enough, both of our kids are really interested, and even Paige, who may not as be as interested in politics, she's she's been activated by my business experience, so she's right. really interested in the business side of things that, that I've had. Um, but at the same time, when Tyler's not around kind of dominating the political conversation, she then steps right up and, and has a whole range of political um, interest of our own. So it's interesting seeing the kids and thriving in their own space. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of, you know, you have obviously a lot of very common Jewish values with parents that were really giving you flexibility, but at the same time, very much focused on education. But for you, I suppose a lot of people not in the Jewish community, you interact with a lot of them that frankly, we don't as much. How do you represent the Jewish community and how do we get, I suppose, my question really is about having them understand us as a people. Yeah, so I reckon our biggest opportunity going forward is we are seeing, particularly around a lot of other community organisations, uh, more broadly speaking, as really having our stuff together. Like, For sure. Like, like the Jewish community has just got it nailed when it comes <clears throat> to running organisations, whether it's in disability, whether it's in... Um, homelessness, whether it's in environment, you know, we've just got our stuff together. Uh, and I think the next step for us is for us to mentor and role model, particularly emerging communities and other communities in this space, because, and if you do that, you fix a lot of other bridges around anti-Semitism and all the <clears throat> stuff that we exist. And, you know, my one side of me, I've been a very, very strong on, you know, the whole ban on the swastika stuff and the anti-Semitism and calling it out, and the stuff that's been happening in the non-Jewish schools and the bullying and everything else. That's the Band-Aid stuff. But then the education game-changing stuff is where we need to be to actually immerse our staff, immerse our community in other communities. And by doing that and by them meeting and experiencing that thing is a game-changer in being able to build that bridge between the Jewish community and the broader community. Is that, in a, said another way, 
people don't see David Sasso as the politician, they see him as the person, so to speak. Yeah, well, people people don't see necessarily David Southwick as in the broader community as as the Jew. Yes. But but you know when I'm out there talking about stuff in the broader community and then I talk about my Jewish values as part of that, they go, oh wow, isn't that really interesting? I didn't know that. So being able to, if you like, tr travel between those different spaces is really really. That's important. what's so interesting to me. And if you don't mind me asking, have you ever come across, especially in Parliament, situations that you just felt very uncomfortable um, from, a, from an anti-Semitic kind of yeah. thing. Uh, look, I've seen it a number of times, right. and, but, but it, again, a lot of the stuff that I've done is around education right. and, and even it, it, it's calling things out as one thing, but having a chat with people is another. I mean, coming right back, yes. interesting to that, to when I was first elected, and the floods things that happened locally happened across the state as well. Okay. So, so I remember going on a, a, a minibus with the class of 2010, which were about a dozen MPs that were all elected at the same time. And we decided to go to rural, rural Victoria and help with the floods. We we're on this bus and we we're all lear learning about everyone's electorate. Because the great thing about politics is people come from different backgrounds and they've got to represent different communities. So we got to Caulfield and they said, <laughs> And someone said, because they didn't know me or who I was, we're all new. And they said, oh, there's a lot of Jewish people. So a lot of Jewish people in Corfu. And I said, yeah, yeah, and I'm one of them. They, really? And these are elected representatives. I said, but you don't look like the traditional Jew. You know, like I said, yeah, what does a traditional Jew look like? And we got into the black hats yeah. and all that stuff. Exactly. We had this conversation. And, you know, fast forward, you know, many of those people went on a trip to Israel with me and got to understand and, and, and experience what Israel and innovation, all the stuff has to offer. Many of them came and had a Shabbat in a core field. Right. Um, most of them would have experienced a lot about what the Jewish community had to offer over that period of time. And for me, I consider that one of my biggest strengths is being able to effectively immerse our successes into a broader community. And, you know, I think my work has only just begun because I think you know, there's so much more that we can do. Yeah, and do you think that there's the there's a high, what I call acceptance rate, where people say, wow, this is how they're doing it. Maybe we should try it out here. 100%, 100%, you know, working with uh, many of the African communities that, you know, the new emerging communities that have just come here that are really struggling getting their uh, that, that, that their own community groups set, set up and how they go about it, how they go for government funding, how they go about you know, mentoring for social enterprises and all that kind of stuff. They just, a lot of them don't know where the starting point right. is. And just being able to provide that introductions and those support, uh, we've been doing some stuff already. You know, there's some great work that's being done between uh, the Jewish community, Muslims, um, Africans, uh, Indian community, Chinese community, you know, a whole range of them in, in understanding and appreciating what we do. And I think that that's the leveler because you know, oh, I did something a few years back with the Chinese community and had an Israel-China business association right. set up. And that was great because a lot of the Chinese business people that I spoke to here appreciate the fact that we are similar in terms right. of the Jewish community, what we value about our education and our kids and our family and all that kind of stuff and the hard work. And you kind of cement that, and then next thing I knew it, we did a we did a trip with local Chinese business people that also went to Israel, and then looked at how they could leverage and and invest in some of the Israeli startups as well. So, um, and then where Victoria sits in in terms of some of that innovation and investment. So there's some there's some great opportunities in terms of, but it's interesting, you know. I think we've only just touched the sides. What really? what 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 worries me? is if you look at those reports, you know, that are, that are run from all the peak bodies and everything that talk about anti-Semitism continues to rise. Yes. Uh, we're not going to fix it <clears throat> by continuing, you know, yes, we'll call it out, but we're not going to fix it by just keep calling it out and and punishing and disciplining people. You've got to, you've got to, there has to be consequences. And that's why the ban on the swastika, Nazi swastika was so important, but there's got to be education. Right. And the education stuff in starting really early is the way that really brings a leveler and 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 not only not only stopping that stuff from happening but also helping others which is what we're all about anyway you right. know like our community has always been so strong in helping others and i think you know the for me and that's why i consider myself 
a socially progressive, economically conservative liberal uh, in that, you know, like, sure, you've got to be able to have a level playing field and encourage people to get along and achieve and success. I, I think that's great. You know, I, I say have a level playing field, but then let everybody run their own race. And if you want right. to sit home and do nothing, that's your choice. If you want to go out and be the next, you know, uh, head of, of whatever company, that's fantastic. Right. It's your own decision. But along the way, there are people that may, for whatever reason, not get onto the starting field. And what do we do to support them? And that's the, that's the socially progressive side of me. Right. And that's what really, I think, frustrates so many people is when they don't feel that there's an opportunity. Correct. And so for me, education is the starting point. If you don't have that education as a level playing field to get on there, you're not going to be able to run your own race. Right. And I think there's so many statistics uh, that... You know, you could tell already, I think it's by year three, where people are going to fall socio and economically. Uh, it's staggering. I think it predicts about 85% of people's success, which is really scary. <clears throat> so, but it's incredible. I'm also curious, how do you keep your Jewish values at the same time integrating into the rest of the Australian community? Well, it's just who I am. It's just who we are. So, um, you know, I'm lucky in that, well, I'm not lucky. Uh, I would not have been a politician in any other seat but Caulfield. So I chose to be right. a member of parliament here because this is where I wanted to represent. And I love the fact that I've got probably 40 synagogues in this area. And there's no no, no shortage. shortage of, you know, going and um, to, to a festival, a simcha, bar mitzvah, or whatever. I've, I've got it there. Um, I've got people in this community that I talk to every day, which kind of centres me and, and the community. I... I, I never had a political background as we spoke about. I had a business background, a very strong community background, but then politics was my way of being able to make a broader difference. But if someone said to me, oh, we want you to go and represent Sunbury or Geelong or whatever else, I wouldn't do it. You know, nothing against any of those areas, but I wanted to represent the area that I am so passionate about where I grew up. So that grounds me every day. You know, and I, I, as I say, I love being able to showcase my community to others. That's that. That's for me. That's my proudest moment is being able to talk up other people. Right. And, and I think as politicians, many lose sight of the fact that the job is not about you, but it's about allowing others to shine. And so, you know, if I can turn the camera on someone yeah. else that's doing something really interesting, that that's my biggest. You know, that's my biggest thing. You know, I've always. In RMIT, I was an entrepreneur in residence. I used to do, you know, do this. I used to sit down and help young people set up their own business. And we ran it like a doctor's surgery. People would come in, sit down, watch the startup, what do you want to do? Come back next week, see how you go. I love that. You know, and, and for me, the biggest, the biggest joy that I get is seeing right. other people realise their passion. That is the biggest joy that I get. And it's not a coincidence that I run the you know, most successful internship in any other politic any other politician because that's what I that's what I set out to do. I right. want and and I'm very, very happy if none of those interns in my office ever do politics. But what I want them to do is to find whatever that's gonna make them happy and go out there and do it. And you know, I use politics as a vehicle. Yep. Absolutely. But you know, you're all about leadership, that's what you do. Here's a pet peeve of mine before we close. There are so many courses and so much information about leadership today in the world. And this is not a political question per se, but it is, but why are we struggling globally? It's not just an Australian thing. Why are we struggling with leadership despite all these resources in your opinion? It's not an easy question. Yeah, obviously. It's, a, it's another really, really good question. Um, I, I'm not gonna blame anyone or other things or you know media, right. media and whatever else in the way that kind of society's moved because you know what? Um, no such thing as a problem, only an opportunity. Right. And, um, and we've just, I think, I think through tough times, leaders kind of emerge. For sure. And, um, and, and, you know, people step up and lead at different times. And, um, and I think, you know, look, we're, we are, we are really, really fortunate in our community, coming back to our community. Yes. In that we have so many really good young leaders you know we really do have a lot of young people we spoke about some trying to engage more young people but look at the flip side we have some great young people orgers all the way through that are just get involved and do stuff and so 
it, it's about kind of really harnessing and championing that and providing more of that in a broader sphere as well. So I think I think um, we, we need to do that. And, you know, like it's probably, again, up to all of us. And what you do in terms of this, another plug here, <laughs> but seriously, you know, what you're doing is it's the same thing. You're connecting people. You're showcasing really good stuff. You're giving people a chance to be able to say, hey, I actually want to play here. Right. And that's really important, you know, that's not, we, we don't want everybody to be the same. No. We want people to find their own journey, their own passion and go out there and live it. And I think, you know, that's where I think, you know, our community does it really well. We could do it even better and then we can ensure that others also are supported by being able to create the same opportunities for all young people and leaders going forward. Great. Hey, David, we've got to wrap it up. Do you have any closing remarks? But it's been amazing, though, just to hear you and hear about your journey. And also, again, you know, some really hard takeaways or good takeaways, when I should say that. Well, Greg, this is, uh, I didn't know what we're going to talk about today. So this has been wonderful to relive some of those, uh, those experiences. Thank you for what, what you and Sharon do with Social Blueprint and, and you know, everyone that's got on board with it. I think that's really, really great. We are lucky as a community to have uh, such an emphasis on um, social responsibility, uh, and I think that's that that is a big part of our grounding. Um, I'm really enthused. I've got to say, in terms of you know, regardless, and I know we haven't spoken about politics, but regardless of elections and whatever else, um, I'm I'm more passionate than I've ever been before because. Um, I think with every day becomes more of a learning in terms of what we need to do. We've got challenges as a state and a country going forward, just generally. Uh, and I think, you know, as you said earlier, it's where as leaders we've got to step up uh, and we've got to provide, you know, the best opportunity for everyone going forward. And, you know, I'm really, really proud to be a Jew, to be someone that lives where I live. And also I'm a proud Victorian uh, and an Australian, but I think, you know, we've got some work to do to kind of reposition Victoria for generations to come, and that's what I'm excited to look forward to doing. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Bye-bye.